We live in some of the best communities in Illinois. We care about our neighbors. We work hard to preserve our quality of life. But there's something we forget about in Elmhurst. A river runs through it, and it's up to us to protect it. Our storm drains flow to Salt Creek, and that means our harmful waste does too. So try using fewer chemicals on your lawn. Avoid leaking fluids from cars. And grow native flowers and plants to absorb more rainwater. Don't muddy the waters. Do your part to clean up Salt Creek. Greetings, and thanks for joining the Elmhurst Cool Cities Coalition this evening for our Sustainable Stormwater Solutions for Homeowners presentation. My name is Lisa Gerhold dirks I am the chair of the Elmhurst Cool Cities Coalition. Our group has been active in sustainability initiatives in Elmhurst since 2007. We are a coalition of many Elmhurst institutions and organizations working together to help our community become more sustainable. These organizations include Elmhurst College, Elmhurst Park District, Elmhurst Library, City of Elmhurst, several District 205 school green teams, the League of Women Voters, Elmhurst Garden Club, several congregations, businesses, and individual Elmhurst residents. This year, we have focused on bringing a variety of sustainability-related presentations to the community, including programs about food co-ops, natural lawn care, community-supported agriculture, beekeeping, and energy efficiency with a tour of Elmhurst College's LEED Certified West Hall Dormitory. We have also worked with city leaders on the 2014 Municipal Electricity Aggregation Program and the new pilot program for public recycling bins in city center. For more information and to stay up to date on local sustainability news and events, please visit our website at elmhurstcoolcities.org or find us on Facebook. Stormwater management is an important issue in Elmhurst. The Elmhurst Cool Cities Coalition is happy to bring you this program this evening as our community works to s on solving our flooding challenges. Utilizing one or more of the solutions discussed tonight can mitigate standing water in backyards and reduce property damage, turn low wet areas into functioning landscapes, create natural habitats for birds and butterflies, and beautify your space. Our first presenter this evening is Jim Kleinwachter. He is the Land Preservation Specialist for the Conservation Foundation. The Conservation Foundation is a 41-year-old nonprofit land and river protection organization with a mission to preserve open space and natural lands, protect rivers and watersheds, and promote stewardship of our environment in DuPage, Kane, Kendall, and Will counties. Well, thank you for having me here tonight. I'm uh, glad to be here. I was a volunteer with the Conservation Foundation for 10 years, and now I've been staffed for 10 years. And if nothing else that I can bring to you tonight is that there's an organization that will help you and that um, they helped me and that's why I'm here tonight and to bring that to you. So we've been around for a long period of time. We're working in Kane, Kendall, Will, and DuPage counties now and being drawn out west into LaSalle, DeKalb, and Grundy counties. And as a not-for-profit, we have a voice uh, as an unbiased uh, helper for you. So we aren't um, driven by regulation. We, we can just listen to your concerns and try to help you. Our major office is in Naperville on the McDonald Farm. It's a 60-acre permanently protected property with a conservation easement on it that protects further development. So that is one thing we can bring to your uh, community is conservation easements on larger parcels that might be in Elmhurst, there might be ways to protect them. We also work with municipalities to buy land. So if there's a quality piece of property, we can assist in purchasing of the land and keeping it as open space instead of um, 
further development that could cause additional problems. We do a variety of activities, pretty much everything environmental that you can think of, we're doing it. We have a, a staff of about 14 full and part-time uh, employees that are uh, doing these environmental activities. What we're trying to get people to understand a little bit is that we all want the same thing. We all want a community that's nice and green and livable and that we all have responsibility to do something to try to keep it nice. And I do a lot of education about the fact that plants are not just decorative things that we've been using them for in, in the recent times. We have to understand this is a plant-based planet, that every living thing on this planet requires plants. And they're the food that we eat, they're the air that we breathe, the oxygen that we're using, they're the soil that we're growing things in, they're feeding all the wildlife and, and every organism on this planet. Plants are the only thing that can turn sunlight into food. So we are completely dependent upon plants for our very existence. So kind of understanding how important plants are to life on this planet. And then the next step from there would be that not all plants are the same. And that there's a, a web of life. And it's, it's not only in the plants and it's not only in the animals, it's in the soil. And we don't have to learn all the details, but understanding that these systems are important and essential for quality of, of life around us. So once we kind of understand that, then understanding that the plants that we choose will determine what surrounds us. And the phrase uh, landscaping as if life depended on it, kind of understanding that it does depend on it. And if I had a table and I put a random group of plants on the table and you were very hungry, and there was a hosta and a banana and some broccoli and a roll of sod, you could easily scan that table and see what, what looked like a food source to you. And you would know, go to the banana or the broccoli because the other two don't mean anything to me. Well, our wildlife is looking at the same way. They look at your yard as, is there anything there for me or not? And so we'll go into some of those details about how we can make a change for the benefit of our local wildlife. So here's the, here's the secret. The plants are what the magic is and the functioning parts. So in the animal world, we understand evolution. We understand that a cheetah is the fastest land animal. And we understand the giraffe has this long neck that can eat the acacia leaves. And we understand a turtle has a shell that it can carry around. And you know, it's got these protections from evolution. But we don't see it in the, animal, in the uh, plant world. And so it's not as visible and so we don't really understand it. But the plants are every bit as evolved as the animal's world. So these plants have found a way to live in Chicagoland in drought and hail and sleet and snow and fire and they will be here long after we're gone. And the place where this library sat was a prairie for 10,000 years. So when we talk about what is sustainable for Illinois, this is the prairie state. And so what plants would we put in here that we know will grow without food, without water, without taking care of them, these plants will grow over and over again. So far as sustainable landscape for Illinois, we're looking at native prairie plants as the most sustainable thing that we can put here that would be long lasting and functional. And we'll go into the function a little bit later. But kind of understanding that on the far left is sod. And sod is covering uh, the largest surface covering 39 of the lower 48 states. So it is the biggest single covering of any state uh, other than the Rocky Mountain states. So in Illinois, there's more sod than corn by far, more than soybeans, more than any other crop that we're doing. We're growing crops of sod and it's causing some problems with the flooding and, and other things that we are incurring. Not only that, but in habitat. So. We'll go into how these plants are functioning, but keeping this in your mind a little bit about the deep roots. They're going deeper than an oak tree. They're getting water from ground source, so they don't need necessarily rain. Some of them with the fine root systems are absorbing rain in the April, May when we get the rain, so they can live through the drought in July and August. 
So similar to a camel, gets water when it can and then can live through a drought. And I'll show you pictures that illustrate these concepts. So this is how the plants work and this is why they're sustainable. And, and there is a difference between these plants. So there's a number of reasons why I'm calling them working plants and that they're functioning. And when we use decorative plants, that's fine, but kind of understanding that if we have all decorative things, it's not going to function. And in your home, it would be the same way. If you had all decorations in your home, you wouldn't have a TV, a couch, a stove, those functioning things that you need to live. And that's what we're trying to restore to our landscape is because we've taken the function out. And then many of the people are saying, well, my yard doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work because of the changes we've made have been negative changes. So that's what I'm trying to do with the Conservation at Home program. What's different about this program than other programs is we will come and help you. So I don't just want to you to get a flyer today and say, here, good luck with your landscape changes, that we will help you. I will come to your house if necessary. And we have got a program for other property too, like business properties. So between residential and non-residential, we can help people of all sizes, schools, churches, dental offices, you name it, we can make positive changes on them if, if you so desire. So this is what changed it for me. In my community where I live, this was the landscape along the river. Now here you're on Salt Creek, I'm on the DuPage. And I called the mayor and I said, this is disgusting, this shouldn't be like this. And the answer was, we don't have any money. And you're gonna find that there's always somebody that's gonna say, you can't do that, there is no money. We, I tried that once and it didn't work. Whatever this mantra is that says you can't do it, we have to find a way around it. So. When the mayor said they have no money, I said, well, what about volunteers doing it? What about the Kiwanis or the Lions Club and other people getting together and doing it? And they said, well, why don't you do that? And so I said, okay, fine, I will. So I uh, ran an ad in the paper and I got my kids and we started cleaning up the river. And people getting involved and getting their hands dirty and getting out and caring about the environment was huge. And I realized every year we started getting more and more people that wanted to do something, get their hands into it and be a part of, of a program that was doing something better for the area. And I called the city um, public works department and I said, don't you clean up things around the city? And they said, well, we clean up things that are around the road. And I said, give me till Monday. And I called him on Monday and I said, there's a huge pile here, there's a huge pile there, there's a huge pile over there. And he, his answer was, you're gonna do this every year, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, yes. So they participated now and they've become part of the, the, the clan. And we've expanded the river cleanup, not just in my community, but we're stretching all over the county and beyond. So Salt Creek, both branches of the West Branch get cleaned to the tune of 700 tons of debris pulled out of the river. And every year it's getting better where there is less debris and less debris. But we stretched all the way from Roselle to Shorewood now. So this is just a ground roots effort to try to make things better. And hopefully when I show you some more examples of things that people have accomplished, maybe you'll see something that isn't quite right and you'll take the initiative to try to change it. I, am a, I have an MBA in marketing, so I'm a salesperson. And I'm going to try to sell you on these concepts today because I realize that you're all asking, like, why, why would I want to be here? What do I get out of this? And this is one of the things I can sell, birds. The very best birds we have, the very prettiest ones, the nicest ones, the most rare ones, and even things like the little wren. So everybody likes the little wren. He sings so beautiful. And you put out a wren house for him, but do you know what he eats? He won't come to your bird feeder. None of these will come to your bird feeder. They're looking for native bugs and berries. So we either have something for them or we don't. If you haven't seen these in your yard, it's because you don't have anything for them. They can't come for a cup of coffee or to chat. They're looking for food. It's pretty tough out there and they need sustenance. So 
This is the kind of thing we talk about when I, when I work at places like thinking about this. Maybe instead of putting in a generic bush, you put in a service berry or a viburnum that has attraction for birds. It's, the term is called birdscaping, where you change your landscape to favor birds. And I can tell you what, that center one on the bottom, the cedar waxwing, if you have a juniper, service berry, viburnums, when those berries ripen, he will be there. How they find it, I don't know, but they flock to them. Uh, they're amazing birds in that regard. So we've been paving over a lot of the land and we need the water to percolate back into the soil. And so when we make these impervious surfaces that do not drain water down, it, that water's gotta go somewhere. And sod is one of the things that's a problem. Uh, typical grass will only take a quarter of an inch of water and then it starts going horizontal. So it cannot come through the, the sod. And things like uh, your quality tree, whatever the best tree you have in your yard, the very best thing you could do to protect your tree and make it stronger and healthier would be to get the grass away from the tree. Trees are not designed to have grass around them. If you went into a forest, there is no grass in the forest around the trees. We need that water to percolate and we need the air to be able to move. And grass is kind of like a tarp. A tarp. So it doesn't allow easy um, transfer of water or air. So that's one of the things that we help people with is what would you put there? And I'll show you some plant choices and things to um, let that water go down. So typically what we're trying, what, what should have happened is on these higher areas in town, water will percolate into the ground and be held for long periods of time. And then it will come back up into a wetland area, cleansed and cool. So the plants have gotten to it, the, the roots of the systems filter it, and it comes up into the wetland hydraulically and it's nice and clean and clear. Well, what we've been doing is we've been paving over the high areas. We're, those are nice areas for your home. So we built up on all the high areas and the, the water can no longer percolate in. And so it's running off and we're, we're running it off horizontally downhill and it's piling up into our low spots dirty because it's carrying material as it moves across the surface. And then we're asking the wetland, to, can you get rid of that for us? And hydraulically, it doesn't work. The water's coming up into the wetland. It, it doesn't do a good job in taking it down. So it doesn't function properly, and we have flooding issues. So these are some of the problems that were occurring. We're pushing it in the river, and I'll talk more about that. So if we were to change from grass to something else, can you visualize it? And that's what I teach about at College of DuPage and other places in these lectures, is how is this gonna look and how would we do this? And so, taking the words from Yoda, the forces of nature are out there and we have to harness them a little bit and use things the way that they should go. And in this particular case, how we do it is clumping the plants and making the fence rows and rocks and bird baths and, and things that we recognize, integrating those into our landscapes to make them attractive. This is a town a house right in St. Charles and they have very little grass, all native plants. And working with Habitat for Humanity, they've converted all of the habitat homes to native plantings and low mow or no mow grass where they wanted grass all native trees and native shrubs. So we can convert these and there's no loss of, um, of beauty or color. In this case, they, it's a hybrid situation of not only native, but native and other non-native plants. And some of the tricks are again clumping and creating a, a rocked edge. So it looks like it was done on purpose, not just a random seeding of things which the typical words that I hear are weedy or messy when it looks random. So for front yard situations, we're gonna make it controlled and we're gonna make it look like we did it on purpose, but the plants can still be those ones I talked about being functional and absorbing water 
taking the downspout water and putting it back in the ground and doing those functional things that we're trying to accomplish. In the backyard situation, we can have some more of the native plants in maybe a more prairie-like situation. You see the grass in the center. They have a place for their children to play, and they're probably putting on chemicals. I don't see any dandelions or weeds in that section of the grass. But they've created a barrier around the outsides where those deep-rooted plants are going to absorb that chemical and uh, a place for wildlife to have habitat also around the edge. So we can incorporate these things in a variety of different ways to still create the function that we're looking for. So oftentimes we see the drain heads, and this is in my yard, and you know, I, that's where I purposely pitch my water so it gets out of here. Well, in a lot of the communities, the, the amount of water that we're flushing into the creek is more than it can handle. And so there's causing flooding from that issue. And we're trying to bring the education to people that the farther you are from the river, the, it's still as important. You may be a mile from the river, but you still have connectivity. And simple things like in this picture, you can see the Black Eyed Susans where the water is coming towards the drain head and we're just gonna intercept some of that water with plantings and filter it and keep it out of the drain head. So in these rain events, the river cannot handle the volume of water that we're sending it. And so we're trying to mitigate that by keeping the water where it falls. If you kept all the water that fell in your yard in your yard, then your neighbor wouldn't have any um, impact from your yard and his neighbor wouldn't have impact from the cumulative effect of this. So if a lot of people are the ones that complain most are the ones that are at the bottom of the hill because their neighbor's water is coming down to them. And you could imagine if your neighbors weren't sending water down to you, how much that would help. So this is, and then you see this and you think, well, that's no problem for me. But the other end of the pipe is where the problem occurs. And it's not just the quantity of water we're sending, but it's the quality of water. It's picked up material on its way down and we all live downstream. So Salt Creek empties into, eventually it empties, it all empties, empties into the Mississippi River. And we're draining that water to the New Orleans. So you can see how large of an effect we have over thousands of miles and the cumulative effect of what happens upstream and downstream from where we are. When I'm working in the Fox Valley, it's pretty easy to see along the Fox that what happens in Elgin is going to Batavia, and what happens in Batavia is going to Yorkville, and so on and so on. So, you know, we have some um, responsibility to water quality and quantity to try to work together to solve these problems. This is a picture of the horizontal flow in a rain event. So the grass cannot handle it, and when it gets saturated, it's just going to go horizontally. The, this is called non-point source pollution, pollution. In the old days, there used to be pipes of chemicals that would come from factories and things. That's all been cleaned up. There are no pipes bringing um, pollution into the river anymore. And now the major cause of the pollutants in the river are non-point source. So they're running off of the landscape. On the streets, they're taking materials, gas and oil and chemicals from your car and washing them into the river. Salt is a huge problem. And off of our yards, we're gonna see that uh, fertilizer is a huge problem. Nitrogen, phosphorus from our grass care. So when the grass can't handle the amount of fertilizer we put on it, it runs off also. So the money that you paid to put on the fertilizer was a waste because it was in excess of what the plants could handle and it's ending up in the river. So eutrophication is the term that they use for excess nutrients in the waterway. It's causing the water to have algae blooms and the algae bloom cuts the amount of oxygen for fish. There's a bunch of negative things that happen with over nutrifying the water. Besides the fact that we're paying for all of that to happen, the waters are running green and brown and we're seeing the effects of, you can see uh, algae and milfoil, duckweed, there's a variety of plants that grow in the water that we don't really want in the water. In homeowners associations, we're paying extra to have chemicals added to kill the plants that are growing because we put the, 
the fertilizer on in the first place. So there's a lot of money being spent uh, unnecessarily and it's causing environmental damage too. So phytoremediation is a word that they use for letting the plants clean it up. And plants do a tremendous job of cleaning soil, they clean air, they clean water. And I'll show you some examples, physical examples of where you can see it happening. But it's, it's an amazing thing. Um, up in Lake County, they have a, a place where they're taking brown water from the Des Plaines River and they run it through plants and it comes out crystal clear at the end. It's just an amazing thing that just plants are doing this. So he, these are the major issues that we're dealing with in our waterways and not just here, but across Northern Illinois. So some of the pictures I show, somebody would say, well, when did you come out and take a picture of our lake? And I say, well, I didn't take a picture of your lake, but your lake problems are the same problems I see in Batavia and Joliet and all over the region. So it's nothing new and it's nothing we haven't dealt with before and we can solve these problems. Erosion is another issue and, and when you look at some of these ponds and detention areas that we have in our communities, they're not particularly pretty. In some cases we're fencing them because we don't want anybody near them. Uh, even the word detention is really a negative um, word. I don't know of any good thing you could say about a detention, whether it be in high school or detention camps. Water was detained and put in this detention area because it was bad. And we've got to change that. We've got to quit thinking about it in that way and, and make them water features and make them attractive and functional parts of our communities. They want to, you know, we want to have a home near a lake. Well, let's have the lake be nice. And if I show you this picture and I'd say, well, would you want to have a picnic there with your daughter? Would you want to go fishing there? Would you want to sit out with your lawn chair near this area? And, um, or being my salesman, would you rather see something like this? So this is a picture, actual picture of a pond in Montgomery right on Route 30 and natural landscaping along the shoreline. So it solves the erosion problem. There's no geese. Geese will not walk through a prairie. They're deathly afraid of coyotes. So here you have good goose habitat. There's geese all over the place making messes and so on. No geese. And so aesthetically, which one's more pleasing? Which one's functioning? Which one is, is better for the environment? And which one do we see more often is the next question. Here's another picture in Geneva. So if I asked you, left or right, which one's prettier? Which one's feeding birds and butterflies? Which one's filtering water? Which one needs to be mowed every week? Which one do you have in your yard? And then the next question is why? Even in the, this was, I took this picture in a drought this, about the same time two years ago. In the middle of the drought, one side is blooming and one side is nearly dead. So you can see the functioning uh, system that the, the plant, the native plants are used to blooming in the middle of July. And that's when they feed the butterflies and that's when they need to be at their most uh, productive. So it's hard to see in this picture, but there's a vast difference between the two so when I show you some pictures of some non-functioning landscapes, this was a school. Isn't that beautiful? Somebody designed this system, big flat roof with the water coming down the downspout, hooked into a pipe that's connected to the downspout, to the um, underground system and into the storm drain so that all that water gets flushed out of here and it's gone. So when they asked me, could we change this? Yeah, that's Death Valley now. And there's no life there, there's no function. And so, yes, we can convert that pretty easily. And, and I had the custodian call and they said, the kids are picking the flowers. <laughs> and I said, what are they doing with them? Well, they're giving them to the teachers. I said, shame on them, you know, we gotta stop this kind of thing. And remind him that the buffalo used to trample the prairie and the little fourth graders are not gonna kill these plants, that we can get over this thing. So. I'll show you some more examples of we've converted properties, but 
the concept of a rain garden. It's just planting wet loving plants in the wet spot and letting them do what they do. So in this picture, we're showing water coming off the driveway and the roof and watching the flow. Where does the flow go? And then intercept that flow. So we can do it up by the house, up by the downspout, or we can do it where it gathers. Maybe it gathers in this corner and we plant plants in the corner that are going to be self-watered, provide habitat, and absorb the water. So this is a pictorial, and this is the actual one that was done that fit that same example. So the water used to flood out onto the sidewalk on the lower right-hand corner. And the kids would have to go across ice in the summertime, or in the winter. In the summer, they would have to wade through water that was puddling on the sidewalk. And we lowered the corner down and planted it, solved the problem. There's a little, uh, right in the front corner, there's a French drain. I'll show you what those are. If there was excess water, they wanted to have another access to uh, use that water. This is a small rain garden we have at the farm. And because of the pitch of the land, it doesn't have to be very large. We slow the water down. That's part of the trick. Fast water is going to erode. And Grand Canyon is the greatest example of erosion, the natural erosion. But we don't want that in our yard. So we're going to slow it down, bounce it off the rocks, and create a, a pool for it. And then plant plants in the pool that are going to absorb that water and dissipate it down. So these rain gardens are not going to hold water. We don't want them as mosquito breeding. So they're going to puncture the clay in the soil. We have heavy clay soil here. The root systems are going to open up the clay and allow that water to go down. In a bigger system, this is two downspouts in the corner coming together. And we run both of the water sources into the pit and plant the pit with native plants that are going to absorb the water. This is a larger one on another building. And you can see where we've lowered the area. Now, it's hard to see, but near each downspout, we put a rubber mat to direct the water away from the house. So we need the water to get away from the basement and get it out into the pit where the plants can get at it. And then from here, the plants do the magic. And voila, we have a beautiful planting area that we don't have to mow. And it's functional. It's feeding the wildlife. And you can come and see this at the farm anytime you want. We have rain barrels and rain, all these concepts I'm talking about today, we have physical ones planted that you can come and see and we're right in Naperville. It's easy for me to sell the concepts on some of these um, plants, like this red one is the cardinal flower. It's probably the most spectacular native plant that we can use in our yards and it has to have a wet spot. So that area you think, well, that area over there is always soggy, it's wet, there's nothing would grow there. Well, some of the most beautiful plants that we can have will grow in those wet spots. And a lot of the plants like the Black Eyed Susan and cone flowers, are adaptive. The plants are used to getting rain in April and May and being dry now this time of year. So they can handle it. And they can handle being sopping wet and bone dry. And it doesn't phase them. So that's why we're trying to advocate for that because they don't die every time you turn around. So there's that pic another picture of non-source point and how the mud and runoff are moving into our stream systems and that's what we're trying to alleviate. This is some habitat we built at the Lyle Village Hall. So the Village Hall was built up high, the parking lot is low, and there was a grass ramp and the water would just come down the ramp and flood the parking lot. So we made a depression and built a rain garden there and it's hard to see it but right there in the center is a monarch caterpillar. So in Lyle the village hall is right between the train station, the police station and right in downtown where you'd think no self-respecting butterfly would go near that place. They found it and they're using it to lay eggs and keep the migration of monarchs going across the United States. So it's an amazing thing to happen right in village hall. So if that can happen, we can do it in your backyard. We can do it in uh, any spot that uh, the animals will come if you give them a place to go. 
Look at some of the pictures of some of these beautiful plants that we can use. The purple one on the front is blazing star. And there's a blazing star that will go in wet. There's one that goes in dry that will want to go in shade. And the same thing with the milkweed for the monarchs. There's, there's one for a wet area. There's one for a dry area. And I'll show you some of the pictures of how beautiful they can be. It's not only the gawky one that you've seen along the roadsides. There are much more attractive species that we can use. But think about if this was your yard, that orange one in the back, that is, that's one of the um, butterfly attractants, the monarchs that have to have the milkweed. That's the orange, the dry loving milkweed. There, there's compass plant in there. The plant turns to the sun. And when you're talking about sustainability, it's like a little solar panel that can adjust. And I take children out and, and walk them through the prairie and they call it a compass plant because it points north. So the kids try to get their head around this. How can it point north? It doesn't know where north is. No, it doesn't know where north is, but it sure knows where east and west is. It can track the sun coming across the sky. Every day that it comes, the plant turns itself to face the sun. And when it turns its wide part to the sun, it's pointing its thin part north. And the settlers could use the plant to tell the direction. So it, hence the name compass plant. But these are just some of the adaptations these plants have, have made, and they're amazing. The history of plants, they use them for medicine, that natives use them for thatching roofs, and you have all this history and stories that you can pass on when you incorporate some of them into your landscaping. Monarda bee balm, very attractive to butterflies. Some of these are very common around your homes, but did you know that these are the ones that are functioning? and that it was different than the hosta or the daylily that you have. And you can find where your plant came from, any plant. You want to look it up, and you know, daylilies are Asiatic. They come from Asia. They don't have function in Chicagoland, so you better like them, like a rose. Roses are not native here, but they have a big, beautiful flower, and so maybe that pays off for itself. Lilacs are another thing. They're not native, but Look at the beautiful flower they give in the spring and how fragrant they are. So we can still use those, but just understand which ones are functioning and which ones are just decorative. The Silphium family, the compass plant that I was talking about, and Prairie Dock, and there, there are several in that category, they have a big root like a carrot, and it just bores straight down through the clay. So they call them clay busters. They, they break open the soil. And there's numbers of times I can tell you how areas that were, have had water sitting were broken free and the water no longer sat there. So they're very functioning plants creating soil. By opening up the soil and letting air and, and water transpire, it increases all that soil life at the same time. And they're pretty at other uh, applications that you can look at. There's that compass plant, or uh, cardinal flower, and the black-eyed Susans in a landscape. So some of these plants are, would be ones I'd recommend for your rain gardens. A lot of the rain garden plants that we have in our rain garden brochure that's in the back, the only problem with that is those are, that brochure is designed for very wet spots that stay wet all the time. And many of our rain garden areas that we're finding now are, they're not rain, gardens in the true sense of it because they're not wet very often. They're only wet when it rains and they're dry the rest of the year, maybe very dry right now. And so we have to use more adaptive plants and not those wetland species in those ones that change. There's uh, the, another blazing star. So there's a variety in all of these family of plants. There's, there's a variety that we can pick from for your particular application and, and I can help you with that. There's one other brochure I have back there that is kind of um, Native Plants 101, where I put little icons about shade and sun and birds like me, butterflies like me. I like water. So with this little icon, you don't have to read the whole manual. You can sort through your plants very easily, and I've separated them by height. So if you want some short stuff for the sidewalk or a tall thing to kind of hide the fence, we can have those things. Some of the pictures, this is another one of the milkweed that likes it wet, and we still can feed the, bu the butterflies. Blue flag is in the iris family, native 
to our area. There's the cardinal flower again. Queen of the Prairie is another useful one for the rain garden areas. It has a big pink flower head that looks kind of like cotton candy when it blooms. Sedges are very useful. So in this particular picture, we've taken grass completely out and it's just a sedge garden, but fully functional and stays green all year round. And it's the workhorse of our rain garden. So we're gonna use sedges to fill and we're gonna use some of the pretty plants to create some color in it. But there are sedges, uh, there's I think 40 or 50 varieties from all the way from deep shade to full sun to completely wet to variable wet and dry. So here's a picture of the pond uh, that I was talking about that is clean and clear. Everybody loves it, it's full of bass. And any, any home that's around pond one, people are very happy. And the people around pond two are screaming, the fish are dying, there's geese everywhere, milfoil growing on the top. It's just an awful lake, it smells, eroding shorelines. Look at, the, look at the difference to the shoreline. This is, grass is kept like a golf course around pond two and all native around pond one. It's the same pond, so it makes a perfect example. It's a figure eight pond and it's necked in the center where it goes through a culvert and there's a road going over it. This same water, it just doesn't exchange. The pond is like night and day between the two different ponds and the difference is the plants are taking out all that nitrogen and oxygen or nitrogen and phosphorus and the, the uh, oxygen level in pond one is high and the bass all move over there and pond two is a disaster. So you can see examples of phytoremediation, of eutrophication, of the things that I talked about earlier in these physical examples of, of lakes right in our area. So we have a picture of a dry well. And basically, if we're not gonna catch it in plants, just run it into the ground, open up the sod, and give it a place to go down. So all of these techniques, whether it be rain garden, we'll get to rain barrels next, we might need a, a variety of these to solve our problems. But incorporating them at the proper place, I think we can make a difference. So rain barrels, we're up over 11,000 rain barrels that we've sold, and ours are repurposed barrels. They're food products that have been brought over from all over the world. We've got cherries coming from Spain, we've got jardiner and hot peppers coming from South America, olives, pickles coming from the Middle East and uh, Greece. And we repurpose those barrels here locally and make them into rain barrels and capture the rain and then we can use it over the days after the rain to water the plants. And the plants, all of our plants, respond very well to rainwater as opposed to city water, drinkable water that we're taking out of our faucet. And the, it's actually better water for the plants, the rainwater is, than chlorinated water that we get from the municipalities. And keeping our drinking water safe and using less of it is, is an important part too. I think you're on um, Lake Michigan water here. So now we're already at the point where we're pumping water from Cook County over here so we can drink it. And we're still at the point where we're flushing our toilets with it and we're sprinkling our lawns with it with clean drinkable water. And kind of getting away from that and using rain to water our plants outside is one step that we can do to conserve water. And if somebody says, well, this is kind of ugly, we can do something about it. It's the same thing about getting over the problem. We'll, we'll find a way. Um, look at this, finding a way. This um, father had the kids that day and he wanted to pick up a rain barrel. So he strapped it on the top of the carrier and walked it home. The little guy inside the carrier doesn't look too happy, but uh, the father got his rain barrel home. So if you thought you needed 20 rain barrels, there's a system for that. So the old cistern has been reinvented and now it's called rainwater harvesting. And the one we have at the farm you can see is 750 gallons. There, we also have a 25,000 gallon tank that you can see. 
We've got a program for stenciling to educate people about what goes in this drain is going in Salt Creek and nobody's cleaning it, nobody's taking care of it, and that water is going downstream. So um, we can do this kind of a thing to help your community. And lastly, it's just a matter of what can you do? What do you want to do to help? And we have a way to earn a sign for your yard if you want to say that you're trying harder. You can be a volunteer. You can aid in the efforts that we've talked about. Um, I think, you know, property values, and there's a lot of things riding on what happens in our communities, and we want them to stay nice so that people aren't continually moving out because of uh, problems in the communities. So thank you for having me out today. Thank you very much, Jim. Our next presenter is Gary Smith. He is the manager of the Water and Wastewater Department at the City of Elmhurst, and also the city's representative for the Cool Cities Coalition. Gary will present details of the city's newly updated municipal rain barrel purchase program, and also introduce a brand new sustainable stormwater educational project that the city has begun along Salt Creek. Thank you, good evening. Um, again, my name is Gary Smith, and I wanna sign up, Jim. Where'd, where'd Jim go? There he is, I wanna sign up. That sounds very good. And, and it, it, it's great that this, uh, some of the exciting things that are happening with the city of Elmhurst are happening at the same time that we, um, that we have Jim out to talk to us about the Rain Barrel Program. We, our Rain Barrel Program started in 2009. But we put a new face to it. Uh, we've got some new information on the website. Uh, it's gonna be easier to get to. Um, uh, right now, the way to access that is you have to use a keyword search, rain barrels, to get to it. But we hope as time goes on that we'll have a, a page dedicated to uh, not just rain barrels, but all the sustainable activities that we're doing uh, here uh, in the city. Uh, we've had a price change. Um, we have, uh, uh, Jim has given us real favorable pricing and we wanna pass that on uh, to you. There's a brochure in the back uh, and um, any questions you have, feel, uh, feel free to, uh, uh, to talk to me about it. But these, uh, uh, the price you'll see on the page is the delivered price, so delivered to your home. There are instructions and I understand that if you have need help on installing it, that, that, that Jim is, uh, willing to help uh, with the installation and uh, to do a number of other things like he mentioned, uh, even come out and help you paint the barrel. <laughs> the, um, uh, the, they can be purchased at City Hall. So if you wanna buy a rain barrel, you go to City Hall, at the City Hall desk, you can use uh, you know, a, a check, a visa, cash, that sort of thing. We are working on a uh, online purchase option which we hope to be available soon just to make it easier for folks where you know we're used to with Amazon and Zappos and that sort of thing uh, it's, it's a lot easier to be able to go online and make the purchase and get it done so um, we're working on that we invite you to come take a look at some of the new things we have there so in addition to rain barrels uh, we have started this week a construction project along Salt Creek um, I brought a copy of, of the plan, just to give you an idea, all of you have been along the Salt Creek um, uh, Trail, and we have four lift stations that we've uh, uh, chosen uh, to put these projects on, which will include rain barrels. Um, it will include green roofs. You'll be able to see an actual green roof uh, uh, working. Uh, you'll be able to see um, uh, native uh, plantings there. We're doing the hardscape now, so that what you'll see is uh, a lot of construction going on, uh, protecting the existing vegetation. We're removing some of the invasive species that are not uh, native uh, to Illinois that Jim talked about in his presentation. We're gonna be doing some clearing and some grubbing uh, as we uh, prep for that. But soon, uh, this site will be there uh, with two purposes. This is an active 
um, site, which means it will actually be taking uh, sediment as it rolls across uh, uh, the earth before it gets into Salt Creek. We capture that and treat that so that we keep those um, uh, nutrients out of the river uh, that um, Jim was talking about. The, um, the project plan uh, will, um, will include, uh, some of you that know Salt Creek, it includes the Harrison Street lift station, the uh, Jackson Street lift station, uh, Berkeley uh, and Adams lift station, and the McKinley lift station. There'll be, uh, we're working on some, uh, uh, some signage, some interpretive signage that uh, uh, Alderman Guttenkopf has been helping us with. We're getting some good progress on that. In fact, I've got a meeting this next, next week with some of the folks that are doing the writing. And so um, we invite you to come out and look at this as it progresses in your run or your bike ride or your evening walk. Uh, please take a look at, at the work we're doing. We also are including porous paving uh, with, this, with this project. Um, so please come out uh, and, and take a look at that. The purpose of this, of course, is to, for you to be able to actually see one working, uh, and we hope you take that concept home with you. Uh, there are QR codes uh, on, uh, there will be on these new um, uh, displays, where you, it will take you to a website, one of them is Jim's website, where you will actually be able to see, uh, and Conservation Design Forum is another one, where you will actually be able to get instructions on how to develop a rain garden and uh, green infrastructure in your home, uh, the type of thing that Jim, Jim was talking about. So uh, those are the two uh, items I wanted to talk about, uh, and I'll uh, turn it over to, uh, to Lisa again for the question portion. So thank you everybody for coming tonight to the Sustainable Stormwater Solutions presentation. We hope you've gained some useful information and we encourage you to let us know about any subsequent projects you undertake at your residence. Hearing about your projects can help us and help the community if we can use your projects as, as examples if you have some success. I also want to thank our two presenters, Jim Kleinwachter and Gary Smith, for sharing their time and expertise tonight. Feel free to direct further questions or comments to the Elmhurst Cool Cities email address, which is found on our website, or to our Facebook page. We live in some of the best communities in Illinois. We care about our neighbors. We work hard to preserve our quality of life. But there's something we forget about in Elmhurst. A river runs through it, and it's up to us to protect it. Our storm drains flow to Salt Creek, and that means our harmful waste does too. So try using fewer chemicals on your lawn. Avoid leaking fluids from cars. And grow native flowers and plants to absorb more rainwater. Don't muddy the waters. Do your part to clean up Salt Creek. Have you visited the Elmhurst Public Library lately? The Kids Library is a wonderful place, especially with our many exciting children's programs. The second floor is home to the adult and teen collections. From research to magazines, we've got it. We have more than 80 computers throughout the building. Or bring your own laptop. The entire building has wireless access. Need a quiet place to study? Try our silent study rooms. Book one of our spacious meeting rooms for your group. Our convenient book drop and drive up window make picking up and returning library materials a breeze. And don't forget, 
EPL is open 24-7 online at elmhurstpubliclibrary.org.